Hello, everybody. Hi, Om Prakash. Good evening. We are going to get started in just a few minutes. Yeah, I wonder how much delay is there from our hello to them actually getting it. <laughs> there may be five to 10 second delay, I believe. Arden, we'll get started in a few minutes. So while we are waiting, uh, to people who are there, can you hear me? Hello, Om Prakash. Are you able to hear? OK. So um, just really quickly wanted to ask, uh, is there something specific which you want to learn in Ember, or uh, are you guys like new to it? and uh, just you know, wanting to get started checking it out. Yeah, we'll wait for the responses. Yeah. New. Yeah. Because it says it's new. <laughs> OK, all of them are new to it. Uh, what other, uh, yeah. what other uh, JavaScript frameworks have you used, or what other technologies and stacks you are familiar with? Who here is new to the concept of frameworks in general? There are some people who are new. There are some people who have done React and Angular. Okay. Okay. So now I know everybody here is new. Oh, there, there's somebody who is familiar with Ember.js. Good. So you know, anytime you want to start, we can begin. I think there are people already here. I think we will get started. Okay. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining this session. Uh, we have uh, Ankush, who is going to do the presentation. Uh, I'm uh, one of the organizers, co-organizers for JavaScript Meetup. Uh, we are doing this as a fourth webinar. Uh, we have conducted multiple other sessions. The last session was on uh, Slack. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, we'll get started now. Over to Ankush. OK. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Ankush. Um, I'm a full stack engineer um, working on my startup. My startup is based out of Los Angeles. It's a very cool new social platform where you can bookmark everything and share with one another. Completely built on Ember. Multiple reasons why I chose Ember in, in the end. Uh, there was a war between Backbone, Angular, and Ember. And uh, ultimately, Ember won the race. Uh, you know, When we meet in person, I'll, I'll be happy to discuss why. Um, and uh, Ember is very different from all the other frameworks you may have used. It has a very steep learning curve. It's very opinionated, which means either do it the Ember way or you're fighting the framework, which makes it very hard for new developers to learn it. But once you learn it, the productivity just shoots up the roof. There are fewer bugs you make with it. There is more understanding with your team. You know, every, Most of the important decisions are already made for you. So you focus on building the app, not choosing which file to put the code in, and how to structure your router, and how to do what, and having bugs with a third party or whatever. So uh, let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. Um, let me know if you guys uh, can see it. I know everybody on the same page says your screen sharing. Can everybody see my screen? Uh, 
Awesome. So, okay. I'm going to walk you through some of the theory first before we get to the exciting parts of coding an Ember app. So it's important to know why you choose Ember because at first glance, Ember can be very intimidating and that drives away a lot of developers. But people who have been in the software development world a little bit, they'll be able to appreciate what Ember has to offer and how it structures dealing with, the, with making web apps. So uh, without further ado, let's, uh, let's start. So Ember touts itself as the SDK for web. Ember is basically, as we all know, it's a JavaScript framework. It's MVC based. It's not full MVC. It borrows a lot of uh, features and functionalities from other frameworks and also from the experience of the developers who created Ember. But by and large, it's, it's an MVC pattern. It follows an MVC pattern. Uh, it was very good for single page applications in the past. But uh, the more it grew in adoption, the more people started seeing benefits of Ember and they wanted to use it for more and more projects. It has expanded uh, beyond just single page applications. And now it, it serves a full spectrum, you know, from mobile to like very high, complex, highly complex web apps with a, a ton of moving parts. So as of now, it's, it's a very strong competitor in the single page application space. But within one year or two, you'll see how um, it, it starts dominating the mobile land as well. And uh, we'll talk about that when we talk about future of Ember. But uh, as I said, you know, Ember is the SDK for, for web. Uh, so basically, an SDK is nothing but a set of tools that lets you create something. So in, in our case, Ember gives you, right out of uh, installing it, a lot of functionality which you can use to make like really kick-ass web apps. And uh, it needs a little bit of knowing how to do it the Ember way, or let's say the right way, in order to get the app built. Otherwise, what ends up happening is you need to know every single thing to do something in Ember. And because you don't know everything yet, which was very easy in the JavaScript land, you know, where you had a bunch of JavaScript files, you could throw away globals, you can call any variable from anywhere and just make the app work from get go. Uh, the downside is if you worked on big projects, you know how difficult it becomes to manage those kinds of apps where there's a bug you're trying to track down, but you can't because some other developer in some other file has used the variable with the same name and caused a bug. A lot of new frameworks are solving this problem, but Ember does it really, really well because it forces concepts on you. So if you don't follow those concepts, you can't really do that, those things. So uh, why do we need an SDK for the web? So ever since web started, it never got time to sit back and unlike you know, mobile apps, iOS, Android, where people get time to think how they are going to make their apps, where they're, you know, able to package their controllers and their services and their views and make sure the performance is very tuned. The web did not get that kind of luxury. Things ramped up pretty quick. You know, you needed the HTML to quickly show the pages. Then you needed CSS for styling them. And JavaScript came to be a way to like throw up alert boxes and do like basic form functionality. And from there, JavaScript just grew. It just blew up. And then browsers had a hard time catching up. Uh, ECMAScript went to six where uh, the browsers are still catching up. You know, if, if you've uh, tried to get a nice app running on Internet Explorer 8, or God forbid, 7 and 6, you know what are the kind of problems we face. So yes, you can build web apps without using a framework, but um, you know it's, it's like cutting a tree without an ax. You just shouldn't do it. So by using a framework, you keep your core sanity in check, because if you don't use a framework, you have to manage a lot of things, which are boilerplate stuff. I'm keeping your app in shape instead of working on the core problem your app solves, which are two very different things. So again, why do we need a framework? It's just simple. When you have everything, when you have major decisions planned out for you, you are more productive from day one. Yes, you need to know how the framework works. That's a separate question. And for that, I am here to help you out. But uh, the more framework solves something for you, the lesser things you have to do in making your app uh, get out there, less errors you make, more time you spend on your real app, which is the most important thing for software engineers there. This is very different from beginners whose core objective is to learn. Most of us are past that stage now. We are working at companies. We are working on our hobby projects. We are working on our startups. And we don't have time to mess around doing and solving bugs, especially with small teams. It's very important to focus on the problem we are trying to solve, the app we are making, what the app does accomplish. So 
let's talk about some companies which use Ember. So as James Cal said, nobody uses Ember. Um, and then followed with this image. So that image is from a workshop which was conducted in Ember Conference 2015. That was two years ago. So there's adoption in people who understand how difficult it is with web apps to make into single, single page complex applications and manage them. So Ember has solved a lot of challenges, and Ember is doing really well. And um, yes, there are other frameworks out there. But by the end of this talk, I hope I can convince you why Ember shines where others fail. OK, so actually, what companies use Ember? There are some of the companies you may have heard which uses Ember, Intercom, Microsoft, Netflix, LinkedIn, Kickstarter, Code School, Travis, Heroku. And uh, there are a bunch of them which are not mentioned on this uh, image slide, which is Apple, Sony, or Twitch. A Vine, you must have remembered, was made on Ember. And there are like a lot more companies which are slowly starting to adopt Ember. In fact, where we have our meetup, the reason why we are talking about Ember is because they want to use Ember as one of their core technologies based on the benefits it's providing us. All right, so far so good. Any questions? Am I offline? Yeah, guys, just every now and then, just send something on chat so I know I'm not offline uh, and, and the presentation can keep going. All right, back to the slides. So the question is, why is Ember good for single developers? So a lot of things I've already spoken about. Ember follows like very stringent, very strict practices of how you should do something. So once you know that singular way of doing something, you're able to get it done the next time. Yes, it takes, it's a slight learning curve where you have to first know what is the right way of doing it, and then you're able to implement it. But the good thing is, that is how you will be doing things uh, from then on. And that's really helpful because as a startup employee, as a big company, when you work on an app which has to, which you have to keep working for the next three years or four years, you don't want the APIs to change too much. You don't want the version upgrades to come out too much because you know what a pain in the ass it is to uh, migrate to this new framework or to be left behind with an antiquated framework which is not supported. So that, that's a very bad choice to make, and Ember completely helps you to overcome this hurdle. So Ember has some best practices which are built in, so there are less mistakes you make. Convention over configuration, which basically means learn how to do it and do it instead of trying to find out from scratch how you want to do things. People in the React world you know, debate about whether to use Flux, whether to use Redux, uh, every new technology that comes out, whether this API to use, by the time they are good in one particular uh, a third-party API, something new has come out, rendering the old one kind of obsolete. So now they have to again make a choice of how to go the new or new way or, or the old way. And then if there are two teammates who have different uh, approaches to solving the same problem, then you have a conflict where both of them now need to sync and learn each other's way before um, trying to get things done. And that creates problems in the long run because then that means more time is spent on figuring out and debating how to proceed which is not great for a company or a startup, or even as an individual employee where, uh, or an individual uh, hobby, hobbyist, where you, are, you need to spend time making your app and not debating over how to make the app. With, uh, with Ember, you end up writing less of the boilerplate code. So Ember has uh, extended from handlebars. They've come out with their own HTML bars, which is faster than before. So you are. Uh, HTML template, or what they call is a, basically a template, is much more declarative. So when you see your handlebar template or HTML bar template, you have a very good idea of what the page rendered is going to look like and where the data is going to fly in, which is very good because that means when you read your template, it's easier to test, it's easier to manage, it's easier to understand. Most of the trivial decisions Ember already makes for you. So as I have been emphasizing since the beginning of this presentation, uh, Ember takes care of good patterns and good idioms. So you, you spend your time making your app solve the problem it should solve, not on solving the problem of how to build your app. And this is perhaps one of the most important points which made me choose Ember for my startup. So. The people who build Ember are the very same people who use Ember in their day-to-day -day projects, which means that they take maintainability and code and technical debt very, very seriously. 
So they keep in mind long-term changes. They keep in mind code migration. They keep in mind versioning numbers. They keep in mind testing. Everything is like inbuilt into the framework itself. And uh, this gave me gave me reliability, which then I chose Ember in 2014. So when I did that, it gave me assurance that at least for two years, um, I'll be able to stick to this framework. So but at that time, I had started fiddling around with Angular and uh, Angular 1. And uh, Angular 2 came out. Angular 1 had a lot of problems. You know, Sometimes you, you look at Stack Overflow, it will say, hey, uh, don't worry, just call scope, just call what will solve the problems. So a lot of things happened magically. You didn't know why. And uh, the framework was starting to bug me. But uh, when, when uh, I was happy about Angular 2 solving those problems, there was also a caveat, which was, hey, uh, by the way, you have to rewrite your code base. And that's not a good thing to hear, because now you're, I'm either stuck with Angular 1 for the rest of my development cycle, or I have to choose Angular 2 with the new API and start writing my code base. So that was really painful. Um, I didn't go that way. I waited. Ember came out of the CLI, and things were just easy after that. No, Janaz, and I'm not giving a sales pitch. <laughs> it's a true story. So again, you know, you make complicated apps. You may focus on logic, not, not on solving the framework problems. As I said before, um, all, all the development choices are made for you. And those choices are made by like experts in their field who take uh, care of like rendering, performance, network issues, bugs, testing. They like spend years before implementing something. The discussions, the, uh, the problem being solved, the testing, the prototyping. It's, it's, it's a very elaborate and very elegant approach to how they actually build things into the framework. It doesn't just happen overnight. There's like a lot of reliability onto, onto their decisions. So as a single developer, when you build your app, you don't have to worry about the long-term implications too much. You know, you know things will just work. And I have another example. I'll probably tell you later how Ember came out with new features without me having to write anything new for my code. All right. So that was just for the single developer. Now, this is the second thing which uh, which drew me towards Ember, which are the benefits you get as a company of using Ember. So the enterprise benefits, there are a lot of them. That is why big companies are starting to adopt Ember or already have adopted Ember, like LinkedIn and Yahoo. They work on the Canary version of Ember because of some of the features they need. And they're actively like investing into the framework. So first is the cost. I mean, as I said before, it's very maintainable. The API changes are, are so well planned that you don't have to migrate a lot of your code. Um, second one is prerequisite before hiring. The way how to Ember, Ember developers code is 90, 95% same. And that is basically because Ember is, convention, Ember is convention over configuration, which means there is generally only one way of doing things. So both people will know from day one at your job, you can start contributing to code. Yeah, sure, you need the domain knowledge. But uh, when you do that, your integration into this new team is going to take you hours, not days and weeks, because you don't have to learn a new stack if you're already an Ember developer. Um, you only need to be updated with the domain knowledge. And now, because all teams work on the same kind of technology, there can be intra-team deployments where you can you know, pull developers from other teams, and they'll be able to contribute to your code from your day one. And, and the knowledge exchange becomes a lot more smooth. So the, and for big enterprises, you know, Ember always stays cutting edge. It has one of the best routers out there. And as you know, you know, especially in the current world, URLs are the web. You know, anytime you get a Facebook link to, to a funny video, or, or you get an imager link, or you go to your mail, or, or you see a, a funny post on Instagram, the URL is the prime thing which decides if you're going to see a mobile view, if you're going to see a web view, if you're going to go to the app, or whatever. So if your URLs don't work, if your router is not good, your experience on the web will be broken. I mean, imagine how frustrating it is if I send you a post to Facebook and you open it on your browser and it just takes you to facebook.com instead of facebook.com slash post slash whatever post ID. And Ember things work from the start and it's incremental. So when something, when something goes wrong, you can catch it much early on. And at the end of the day, one thing that we developers have to remember is the customers don't care if you use the latest and greatest uh, if, if the thing doesn't work. All they care about is if their app is working and if it's working fine. And of course, this, there are metrics which we can use to decide on that. But at the end of the day, they don't care if it's React or if it's, it's Ember or if it's Angular. They want their app to work. That's pretty much it. Ember tries to future proof itself. So whatever technologies are going to become standard in future, it tries to incorporate early on and slightly and, and gracefully modify the developers to use it. 
So, you know, it's already using ES6 modules. Uh, it has its own interpreters in between. Uh, when ES6 becomes standards, all you have to do is remove these two lines and the rest of the code remains the same. You have uh, a lot of other features, broccoli, ESLint, live reload, which is like, these, these are things which are inbuilt into Ember. This is not something you have to like bring in from outside as a third, third party add-on. These are things which comes built into Ember, so you have to use them. And um, yes, that is a problem for a lot of developers because they don't like the idea of being forced to do things a certain way. But hey, you know there are productivity benefits of being forced to do things a certain way. Ember is also really big on testing. Every time you generate a new controller, or you generate a new template, or you generate a new component, it immediately creates a test for it. So you don't go, hey, you know what? Let me just make the app today, and tomorrow I'm going to go and write the test, which never happens. So the test is created right then and there. And then now, since it exists, it's in your best interest to go and fix stuff there. Uh, and by the way, that test also comes preloaded with a little bit of code of its own. So if you mess something up in your uh, actual uh, template code or your controller code, it starts throwing off warnings and errors. And Ember comes out with its own Ember inspector. So as I said before, stability without stagnation, because Ember keeps on track with whatever other current uh, offerings by other frameworks, and it incorporates it into themselves. It's really useful. And really, the, the assurance which you get that I will not be left behind that if I don't choose Ember today, if I choose some other framework, I'll be up and greatest with the newest feature. It's, it's really powerful when you know your app is going to stay in market for three years, five years, X number of years. Uh, Ember team also provides you with code mods. Whenever there are like changes which will require a lot of lines of code to be changed, they give you a code mod, you run it, automatically changes everything for you. You don't have to do anything on your own. So recently, they started incorporating the JavaScript modules API, which is basically, uh, before this, if you had the Ember framework, it came bundled as one entire package. And uh, so most of the times, the developers didn't use everything the framework had to offer. So you had to download the full framework file, and then you could run the code, run, run your app. Now what they're doing is they split their uh, framework into different modules. And at the end of the compile phase, or the transpilation phase, they will see what parts of the modules you're not using, and they will remove it. So it's called tree shaking, if people are familiar with that. And what, what that will do is it will make your framework size a lot smaller, or smaller and smaller means less network calls on, on your uh, client's device, uh, smaller size of package, minor benefits, or sorry, major benefits. And uh, to, to use that, Ember team provides their own code mod. The great community, there, there are add-ons for so things which you want to use, which are built by other people. You can share them with one another using add-ons. This is pretty standard now in frameworks, and testing is built in. Uh, add-ons have their own site where you can find uh, different kinds of add-ons for your use. I'm going to show you a few examples of them. Testing is built in. So all you have to do is go to your local host. Uh, they give you a particular domain. You know Those tests run automatically, so you don't have to like make a complicated configuration in order to test your uh, code. So that, those were the enterprise benefits. So people still here? I know, I know it's a little boring, but now we're going to get into fun stuff where we're going to learn Ember. I'm going to show you uh, a few sample things you can do with Ember. And then the other two things are really small. So we'll be done pretty quick after the code examples. All right. Cool, everybody's still here. Okay, so when it comes to learning Ember, oh, I'm sorry, learning Ember, as I've mentioned before, it's not easy. And the reason it's not easy is not because the concept is complicated. It's because we are used to JavaScript, where uh, you know we could do a certain thing n number of ways. We could use any file. We could create our own file, dump it into the HTML, and and make it work. Or we could write a new script tag and put the variable there. So we had a lot of flexibility, which came with a lot of problems. And in Ember, you have to know how to do something before you can do it. And that kind of uh, being forced to do things in Ember way gives us the productivity benefits, which I was talking about. So this is not something you're, you're going to be able to appreciate now, but in future, when you work with bigger teams or when uh, there are less problems, you, you'll understand why. So I'm going to now talk to you about how basically an Ember app works. So as I said, URLs is basically now the web. In fact, it was always the web, but now it, it's more web than before. What I mean by that is um, when you go to a particular URL, which is a route, the Ember understands that this has to be handled by the framework. 
So what it does is it loads the data which is required for that particular URL you are on. So if you go to facebook.com, it has to load your newsfeed. If you go to facebook.com slash post slash some ID, it has to just load the video content and the comments of that post. It doesn't care about anything else. So understanding what data to load on what uh, URL or what route is very important. So Ember understands this inherently. So when you go to a route, it loads the model. It then sets this, this data, this model, onto something a controller, which is basically a singleton. Uh, every route has its own singleton, where it stores the data for that particular route. In the meantime, the route also renders a template. Template is the biggest holder. It's, it's basically the page, the, the holder, of the, the main page you're going to see for that route. So if I go to slash home, home template is what I'm going to see. If I go to slash settings, settings template is what I'm going to see. Now inside that, like Lego blocks, you can use different things we call components. The templates loads these components. Now, for example, if I go to the, the video post I was talking about, you'll see the comment section there. This will be the same comment section you will also see in your news feed. So that entity is being reused. It has a text box. It has a list of previous comments for that particular uh, content ID. Uh, if you hit enter, it, it submits your uh, post. You can like things. It, it tells you the number of likes, reactions, etc. So these things, the reusable blocks are called components, and the templates load these components for you. In Ember, the way you load uh, components, templates pass the data down to components, and the components then passes it down to its child components and so on. So remember, data always flows down. And whatever the component does, the action is transmitted up. And what that means, I'll show you in the code example we do after this. And the controller then is able to send whatever data it gets. It's able to set on this template, and everything shows up. So Ember has its own build tool, which is the Ember CLI. To install it, you can just do an Ember install minus G Ember CLI. If you guys want to do that, I'll, in, in the comment section here, I'm going to write it. So you can do that so that it installs in, in the background while we still talk about other things of Ember. Oh man, got auto-corrected to GNOME instead of NPM. Sorry about that. So I, I'll wait here for about 10 seconds so that you know you can open up your terminal and run this command. So people who want to like maybe follow along or just have this installed into their systems. There are a lot of concepts of Ember. Um, it, it follows like an object model. So people who are uh, familiar with uh, Oops programming, something similar, a lot of things, blah, 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 not important. This is the fun part. And a lot of people who come from a real background will feel at home here. OK, so I've got, this just a question from route, which will end up first, a template or a controller? So these things happen. Uh, I believe it's the controller which gets set. And because it's controller has to deal a lot with promises, because the model has asynchronous nature built in because of Ember data, um, as things happen there, in the second run loop, the template is being formed. So they, they happen concurrently. Because uh, the controller issues a promise to the data, the model it needs, and once they are ready, they get passed onto the template. That's why, if you notice, the arrow in the end, which gets set state, happens from controller to template. So controller first, then the template. But for the user, they happen at the same time. So coming to the project structure of Ember, people who have worked on Rails, you know, it's very similar. So you have your app. You have your different components. You have your controllers. You have your helpers. They're all neatly bundled into their respective folders. As I spoke about, the good thing about Ember is that they stay there. You cannot have a helper sitting in the routes. Uh, just won't work. It will have to be uh, inside uh, the helper's folder and with a particular format. Styles, templates, I mean, application code, app, coding stuff. Uh, I'll show you an example of what it looks like. OK. Now, M the readability of Ember templates is something which was very important. Uh, they didn't want a lot of logic to be there in the templates, because if your declarative syntax starts becoming imperative, it breaks the nature of your web apps. And that's not a good thing to do to your developers. 
So this is a simple example of what templates look like in Ember. So if you notice, they're basically uh, almost like your HTML nodes. So if you want to render the name of the person, you know, hello, strong, first name, last name. So whatever goes in the in the double squiggly braces is uh, something to do with Ember. Um, usually, single words uh, refer to helpers, and it refers to uh, variables, which comes from the controller. If you have something with a hyphen, that is generally a, a, a component, because they want to distinguish a rendering component from a variable name, they follow that notation. So a component will have to have a dash in it somewhere. It's a hyphen. It, it's a standard. It's a convention. So you cannot have a component named modal. It will have to be something like modal hyphen dialog or modal hyphen box or dialog hyphen box. The hyphen has to be there. Um, the corresponding controller there uh, has the first name, has the last name. When you uh, run this app, you know it will just basically show you hello. For all purposes, it looks like this. The name gets replaced there immediately. Now, if you in the controller change the first name, change the last name, because there is two-way binding, the data immediately reflects. So you don't have to write code to sync those two pieces of information. There are certain conditionals. By conditionals, I mean you know if you have a variable named person or is person or something like that, you can decide what message to show based on what is the value of that variable. Um, you can use else if statements as well, uh, simple things too. As I spoke about, components are reusable blocks. So for example, the comment section is a reusable block. You want it in, in your post. You want it in your video. You want it in your uh, news feed. You even might want it in your status bar. And they have their own context. They store their own information. They get help from their parents. Whatever they do, they can manage independently. OK. So now we'll take a small break. Um, by small break, I, I mean it's not going to be theory anymore. What uh, we, we are going to do is I'm going to uh, build a sample Ember app. So what I want is um, the templating is based on Handlebar JS. Yes, it is based on Handlebar JS. Uh, Ember team created their own version called the HTML bars, which is 30 to 35% faster in rendering than the handlebars. And because it's it's tightly integrated in, into Ember, because Ember understands, because Ember are the one who um, created in the first place, the coupling of how the framework works with HTML bars is, is really, really good, which is different when you use a third party API and you play the game on their rules. Here, the whole framework as a whole box is made to work absolutely fine with one another. So OK, so let's do the demo. So you already have, um, I already have the Ember CLI installed. So let's say I want to create a new project. And uh, a simple command, I'll do Ember new, let's say, webinar. So I'm going to go ahead, create the project folder, create the project structure, install the NPM and Bower dependencies. In time, I'm going to open it. webinar so webinar um, the project structure is pretty straightforward you have app you have config node modules you don't have to worry about um, anything which you uh, want to access as a resource like an image or an audio file or something of that sort goes into the public folder you have all your tests which go inside the tests, which I spoke about. Vendor is where you put third party API code, you know, something like moment, low dash. You have Ember variants of the same. So if there is an Ember variant, it might be advisable to use that before using a third party library. But basically, you can use any third party library, call it into the Ember environment, and run it just the regular way you do. OK. App is where all your application code is. So that's what we're going to use. All right. So I just bought in app. I'm going to call this here. And oops. OK. All right. So if I run localhost 4200, you know, there is no server running. There is no nothing serving on that particular port. So of course, there is no site there. So OK, it seems like my 
I have a question here. If I pass an object to component and modify the object, then does it affect the base object and controller? Um, yes, it does. But there are things called one-way binding. So you, if you bind it using a one-way binding from the parent to the child, it will not be updated. But generally, the things are bound two ways. So if you change something in the, in the uh, child, it will get changed in the parent. So I think that answers your question. All right, so let's go to this uh, folder. Cool. OK. So right now, you know, style has an app.css. There's template, there are routes, there is models, helpers, controllers. Everything's empty, basically. That's why you have kit keeps everywhere. So let's see what happens if I run, run my uh, Ember server right now. I'm going to run Ember S. It's going to go over my code and it's going to uh, create the code in the disk directory. Uh, we don't need to worry about that because we're in development mode right now. All we need to do is go to localhost 4200 and it will serve the app. So without writing anything into my Ember app right now, if I go to localhost 4200, nothing happens. Why? Because I have a typo. Instead of calling it localhost, I'm calling it localhost. I'm stupid. Okay. If I go to localhost 4200, it immediately gives you a success message. Um, the app works. Uh, why does this nice looking page show up? Because Ember people don't want it to get scared. You have a quick start, you have the Ember guides, everything you can you need to get Ember up and running. So don't worry. Uh, so this, by default, anytime the Ember app runs, it runs the, everything inside something called the application template. If you notice template, application template. This is where the welcome page thing exists. I can remove this and just keep the outlet there. Outlet is where the other stuff inside the page renders. I go back. I'm going to just put this here so that it's close. OK, if I go back, you know, application page now shows nothing. So I'm going to say this is application page. And boom, it shows up immediately. Live reload is, is something built natively into Ember. I didn't have to install anything for it. So application page is the container for an entire app. So if there is something like a footer or a header, some branding, some color, something you want, that exists on every single page, you put it inside the application .hps. For our purpose, uh, this is fine. We can just leave application .hps as it is. And now we can create our own uh, pages. So let's start by creating our index page. So to create anything, you say ember generate. So right now, I want to create a route. I want to say, hey, I want a particular route to exist, and that is my index route, something which I go to the first. So I have router.js. So if you notice right now, the map lines 9 to 10 has nothing because the app doesn't have any URLs available to it. It just, just got created. So I say, hey, by default, always have an index route. So what if you notice now, it creates an index.js, which is the route, whatever happened inside the route. And then you also have the template, what that route shows when you go to it. So by default, they are named the same, index, index. And then because Ember is so good with testing, it also creates a test for it. So right now, I can go and write certain tests inside route test and make sure that everything works. But let's not do that. Um, now, if I go back here, all right, resolver. So now I have an index.js route available. And I also have an index.hbs template available. So application, by default, loads. And inside application, I have an index route. So I can say this is index page i save this i come back because i'm right now on slash this is going to show an index page now let's create another page and let's call it um, let's call it meetup so i'm going to now create a route called meetup boom that route exists if i go to uh, slash meetup this is the meter page. Of course, it doesn't have anything because we never put anything in there. So index doesn't need a route, but meetup needs a route to understand explicitly what it is. Inside this meetup, I have this meetup template. So quickly, can I have a few names? So I have Om Prakash, Anigrahi. Am I spelling it right? I have Partha. OK, then I have Arkentos, TN. I don't know what TN's for, uh, Rahul Gupta. 
any other, any other names I should mention? Oh, I'll name, I'll put my name. And our sweet host, Jonathan. Okay, you know, that thing, it, it just puts everything together because we haven't put any tags. We just thrown normal text on, on, onto a web page. So uh, we are going to use this data as we proceed. So this is my um, routes. Now the thing is, I need to hold this data somewhere. So this, this kind of data usually comes from a backend somewhere. It gets loaded into uh, your uh, persistence layer on your app, into your cache, and then gets shown. But for simple purposes, we're just going to like make it from the controller. So right now, we have to first go ahead and create a controller which is going to hold uh, the data. Uh, if you don't create controllers yourself, by default, internally, Ember creates one for you. But because we want to extend the functionality and have our own data inside of it, we have to uh, generate it ourselves. So right now, I'm generating a controller for the Meetup page so that I can store this data into it. And uh, we'll take it from there. Okay, so I'm going to take these names out of the HTML and get it into the controller. So I can say names. No, I need an array. Um, paste. It's going to be a while because they're not formatted. And again, which version of Ember are you using? So I think I'm using 2.16.2. Uh, what version of Ember did it uh, load for you? If you go go to the CLI and you say Ember minus V, it will tell you what is the Ember version it's been um, using, what's the node, and all the details. So just let me know what version of Ember CLI it installed for you. Anything above 1.13 is, is the same for our purposes. All right, so I have these names here. Cool. Uh, what I'm going to do is I'm also going to say meetup name. Let's say this is uh, JS Bengaluru meetup. So I've put two things. I put an array and I also put a, a meetup, meetup name inside of my uh, app for now. I just want one variable out there. I can say meetup name and Ember knows oh, that. So this is also a good thing about Ember, by the way. If you make errors and you go to view them, it won't fail silently. It will throw this big ass error onto your face saying, hey, you have an error. Go fix it. And it tries to help you out where the error is. So I can see between line 8 and 9 after Ankush, I have not put a comma. And that is why it's complaining. So I'm going to go put a comma here. And it should work. So now. It immediately says, hey, JS Bengaluru meetup. OK. So now that this is here, what we are going to do is let's style the page a little bit. So if you want to style something, of, uh, you have this folder called styles, which has app.css. Inside this, you can make multiple files and import them. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so let's start with making a body color. Uh, what should I make it? Um, background color, let's say gray. So, you know, everything becomes gray instantly. There's hot preload. Guys, if there are any questions, if there are any doubts, just type them and I'll try to answer them now. If not, we'll, we'll meet, up on, meet up on Saturday and uh, I can teach you more things about Ember then. Router we don't need anymore. You have a meetup name. Am I online? Yes, I'm online. Okay. Cool. So I have these. I have these. Can I have a custom dots custom dot CSS file? If so, how I will append? Okay. Yes, you can have um, custom CSS files. I'll show you. So if you go to the styles folder, let's create a new file and call it uh, colors. So I'm going to put body. background red. And I'm going to save this as colors.css. 
this file comes up here. And now I can go back to my app. App is the entry point by default. I'm going to remove this and I'm going to say add import uh, colors. Uh, no, this is not SAS. So I'll have to put .css. Boom. Yeah, that's the ugly right. So I had a custom named file called colors that I was able to uh, put everything that belonged to that particular color and it worked. In routes will come all controllers and in templates will come all templates or HTML file. Routes will come all controllers. Right, right, right. No, oh, sorry. No, see, routes doesn't have, I wish, uh, let me see if I can zoom it. Is my screen getting zoomed for you also? Let me know if my screen is getting zoomed. I'm trying to zoom it internally. It's a web, it's a OS accessibility feature, but I don't think it will zoom for the screen share. So if you can see like bigger zooms of, of the project folder, let me know. Increase font size. That's actually a much better idea. Okay, I am increasing font size, but it doesn't seem to be applying on the left side here. Um, view. Sidebar, no layout, references, settings, yeah, font size. Do anything? It made this big, but it's not making the left side big. Zoom. I, I am zooming using the OS feature, but I don't think it's zooming for everybody. I don't know what other zoom to use. Mm. Okay. Yeah, so back to the question. So controllers, this, there's a controller folder here, which has, I'm going to close most of the folder so it's easier to understand. The templates folder will have the templates. Styles will have the styling. There's a global styling. There is also component level styling, which I'll teach you how to use. Routes will have the routes, which is what happens when a route is loaded. Models will have the data, how our different models are going to look like. No, we're not going to get into that now. Helpers, helpers are helping functions like, you know, when I put currency and the number, display it with, with the proper symbol. Or if I put a number rounded, or if I put a date seconds ago, seven seconds ago, something like that. So helpers, you put raw data in and it gives you formatted viewable data out. Controllers is where you have the controllers. I only created a controller for meetup page which is basically, this is, I just wrote this center part and everything else was written by the Ember framework. And then you have components, which we haven't worked with right now. So, okay, so if you notice, line number five is where I had a variable named meetup name and uh, it, changed, it was JS Bengaluru meetup. And in my template, meetup.hbs, I'm gonna remove the outlet for now so you don't get confused. Oops, sorry. Okay, so if I just render, I say r meetup, page name is and then I give and then I give a break and I go back. I'm gonna get rid of this red if you don't mind. It's driving me nuts. So I'll go to colors, background, I'm gonna to change to white. All right. No, why should we do this? We should go back here to our app page in our HTML say One size, 30 pixels. Yeah, that's better. So if you notice, this comes from, from our, uh, our controller right now. Um, let's go ahead and create something simple. So I'm gonna close the route. You're not gonna use the routes very much. I'm gonna create a simple button here. It says click. So this will be an error because the syntax error. I go back, there's a button which exists here, a small, tiny button which doesn't do anything. So the way things work in Ember is this template page, the, the, the HPS is tightly integrated with the JS page here. So if you want to do certain things, you have to declare something called the action hash. So let's name this uh, 
button was clicked and my button. This was one quick example. I declared a function uh, which is basically an action called button was clicked. When you click it, something happens. So I go back here. Inside this, I can add as an attribute an action and give it that name. So we can immediately guess what happens. When you click that particular button, this action will be initiated, which will be whatever function call was made in this JavaScript file, which basically alerts a my button. So I go back here, I click it, and it works. So, it's, so it keeps your logic very separate from the UI action you wanted to do, and you immediately know how they are associated. The meetup page is linked to the meetup.js page. Um, but let's do something even cool. Um, when we do this, what we want is you're going to say this dot set whatever was name of my meetup to a new value. So I'm going to say this dot meetup and let's call it Bengaluru is the best. Right? So we're basically what so get and set is Ember 101. The reason why you don't just say this dot meetup name is because when you change the variable, you want the bindings to also change everywhere. So this variable could have been called in 10 different places. A lot of computer properties would have been dependent on it. You want everything to fire and trigger when this variable changes. So when you call this dot set, it makes sure that it's the, the value change is observed. How is the data printing in template without outlet? So uh, Partha, outlet is not what you use for the data. Outlet is where the future versions of the templates are going to render. So if you had a page called slash meetup, slash Bangaluru, slash um, JS14, like if you went inside the URL, that template will be rendered inside the outlet part. So imagine you have a big holder, which is slash meetup. Inside that, you have a smaller holder, which changes based on where in, in the meetup you are at. So we, for our purposes, we don't need that outlet. But if we had slash meetup slash JavaScript, we would have needed the outlet to exist because outlet would have been the part where rest of the page, the JavaScript page, would have loaded. Anyway, so here I say this start set meetup, a name to Bangalore is the best. So I come back and I click this. You notice that immediately the value here changes. So again, I click it. It sets the variable to its new name because it's bound to the UI automatically. It changes here within an instant. Now you can you can do more things, uh, more things with um, rendering. So what I can do is I can um, make this button disappear if um, most click. So you have Ember conditional. So I can say if is button hidden. No, if button shown. Otherwise, I have to use an unless helper. Slash if, if button is shown, you do this, blah, 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 blah. So by default, you know, it'll have a default value, so I have to say true. And when I click this and I set, when I set this, I can do a this dot set, is button shown to false. I'm gonna also show you the internals a little bit here of how this page is being rendered. Okay, so inside Ember is creating this page from you from scratch. So this is where the the outline of the page is. It, it assigns a random ID to it called uh, Ember 230, which is an Ember view. This is the template path which we wrote. And because button has an action to it, it's associated an ID with it. So something needs to happen when you click it. Now if I click this button, if you notice the button has disappeared and it's no longer here, it just leaves like a slight trail of where it was. This happens because the button is wrapped inside an if if thing, uh, block. So the moment the button shown variable becomes true, this uh, sorry becomes false, this thing is removed. This is very helpful when you have to like control what elements to show and hide based on certain data, which is there in your uh, app. But this is like a basic, simple way of making a simple app. And um, I'll show you how to make a quick component. And I think after that, I'll wrap up the demo. We'll go back to discussing Ember, and probably 15 minutes from then we'll be done. So before we get started with the, with the component, I'm going to also show you a new thing which uh, Ember has started using, uh, which is called 
module unification. What you want is basically your components to exist all together, not separate. So in order to do that, you have to make a slight change, which is uh, blank config dot environment dot js. You have to go here where you have the module prefix. You say pod module prefix. You don't wait for one time thing. You say webinar slash pods. So what I'm telling Ember is, hey, I'm going to now keep all my components together in this new folder called pods. No, it's not a new file. It's a new folder, pods. But before this, if you create a component, you put the template file in one folder and uh, the behavior file in another. Uh, and people in the Ember world are now starting to use it just one place. And very soon, with model unification, that's a new RFC which they created. Uh, things will happen that single way. So I'm letting people adopt this new practice from the beginning so that when it comes out later on, you don't have to worry about this new way of ha things happening. There's no magic. So it's just a standard where people are moving towards. So now, if I want to create a new component, I say Ember generate component. What is happening? Um, let's see. Uh, what component can I create? It's a meetup. So event, let's say RHVP. Now, if you remember, oh, how was the button? How the button was clicked bound with the button click event? Okay, so on the template page, this was my button, line number seven. So here I put the Ember action. So if you notice, this part here is an Ember action. So I said, hey, it's of type action, which basically means something needs to happen when the button is clicked. It's because button gets clicked, it's a default action. I could be more specific by saying on click, but you don't need to because button generally get clicked. So I say, hey, when this button is clicked, I wanted to perform this action called button was clicked. And this is something we have to define in our controller. Whatever is the controller for that, this particular template. So components will have their behavior, controllers, our templates will have their controllers. So in, in the controller page, I have defined inside actions from line 19 to 22, button was clicked. So immediately when you click that button there, it knew that it was supposed to perform whatever was inside the function here. And because everything in Ember is two-way bound, so when I change this variable name, it automatically changed automatically here. I didn't have to write any code for that. When uh, this button shown became false, uh, this thing got triggered. And because this became false, the button itself was hidden. So I was able to, con uh, to control aspects of the UI by controlling what happens inside my app. So again, moving back to uh, creating a new uh, component. Now we're going to make components. Components are the reusable blocks. So I'm going to say Ember generate component. Uh, let's say when we RSVP um, on different events. Um, so let's let's make a like component. You know anything which we make on our meetup page, you want to be able to like. If it's an event, if it's a comment, if it's a profile picture of somebody, if it's a, a title which somebody has posted, anything you want to just like. And this component is going to be literally everywhere, so we don't want to write the same code over and over. So we're going to make it into a component. So I'm going to call it a like component. Uh, now, can somebody tell me why this component um, cannot be named? Um, why will this not work? No, that's not right. Okay, how about now? If I name it like this, this will still not work. Why is that? And this cannot be a predefined word, hopefully. Yep, Ankit is right. Uh, components in Ember need to have a dash in their name. Very good. So I can't call this just like. I have to call it something like no hyphen. Exactly. Uh, no, it's not a global component. It was because we didn't put our dash. Even if I put this, this will be this will work. 
but we should be more descriptive. So let's call it like item, you know, something different. Okay, this is not the pod structure which I wanted to show you. So if I have, if I've created something, ember G is generate. I can destroy destroys D. I can destroy whatever I've created by doing this. So this will remove whatever it just made. I'm going to recreate the like component, but this time I'm going to pass this flag called pod. What pod does it? It groups the behavior and the template file together. So it has created it. Now inside this, I have my pod folder. Inside pod is components. Inside components is the like item. So this is the template file. This is the component file. I'm going to close the app.css. Now this is a template file called yield. When you use a component, you sometimes want to pass data which should appear inside that component. So that comes up in yield. Like we have outlet for templates. We have yields for component. I don't need yield, so I've got rid of it because we're never going to use the block format. I don't have to worry about it. Just play along. Component is where the behavior of that component will go. So again, let's make, let's say this is my component. And um, when this component is inserted, let's make a did insert element call a hook um, and say component was circuit. Okay. So when I go back to my meetup page, here's my meetup page. When I go back to meetup page, nothing happens because member server is down. So I should run my ember server. All right, the server is running again. Can go back. The page works, but uh, the component is nowhere here. I I'm going to reduce a few things on the page so we can focus on what's more important. So I'm going to remove this. I've commented it out, and uh, now we're going to call our component here. So to call the component, it's the same thing. I have to call it by its name. So it was called like item. That's it. My component is now rendered, and because it was rendered immediately, it also called the action it was supposed to call when it renders. So component was inserted immediately, popped up, and uh, it says this is my component. But I'm going to hide the button also. You don't need it. So I'm just going to show you what rendering components look like. This is my component. So basically, the component is a small part which has gotten rendered inside the page. Well, maybe we should have this back so we know. Yeah. So we have this uh, meetup name there, and we have this is my component, which is coming from my component. Now uh, I'm going to switch off this alert part because. So I will keep making those annoying pulls. I don't need this. Didn't that it's just one of the hooks which the component offers. There is one hook called will destroy component, which runs when you destroy the component. So if you have any cleanup to do, you can put it inside there. Um, I can put in a click event, which says I was clicked. If you click whatever is the component, it will run. Now if I go back, if I click it, I was clicked shows up. So you can do different things. But let's uh, do something more interesting. I'm going to stop the server again. I'm going to, now we're going to work with something called Ember add-ons. So these are third party, uh, third party or sometimes from the Ember official team. There are additional functionality which you can use in your Ember. So one thing is if you want, so right now, our template file and our component is together. But if I want to style this, this is my component, I'm going to put it inside a div and I'm going to call it, um, like holder, like I'm just going to call it like uh, holder of like I'm going to call it to not have any confusion. So this is a basically a component which will have all my likes. I can close this. Now I can take this. Does anybody remember where the styling goes? Styling basically goes in app dot pss, and because it's a class, you need a dot. Holder of likes. I'm going to put a background color of green. No. Okay, maybe not. So come back. Oh, again, I have not run my server. So. 
Green is the component which comes in from something else. I'll show you, if I go to my index page, just slash, there's nothing there. It just says this is an index page. So right now what I'm going to do is, I'm also going to go to my index template, which was in templates index. And in, instead of outlet, I'm going to also say like item. So I've reused that component to, to do different pages now. So if I do this, this component also starts showing up into my index page. So now I'm no longer on the meetup page. I am on slash. I'm no longer on slash meetup. I'm on the index page here. So um, now I have styled it here. But the problem is, if you have different components, let's say I make a component and I have holder of likes inside of that, and I have styled it a particular way. If there's another developer, and this is a problem of cascading style sheets, you have to be very specific about what rules you're using. In their file, have a holder of likes, and they color it red. There's a conflict. And uh, sometimes it's harder to predict which CSS file will run. So the people who worked on Ember came out with this really cool thing called Ember Component CSS. So if you want to install it, you say Ember install Ember Component CSS. I'm going to stop this. This runs, this runs, this runs. Cool, so it's installed. I'm going to run my server again. Because when you install certain uh, add-ons, you should rerun your server so that the new things can take effect. Uh, now I can go back. Now what I can do is, when my like item exists, the, the, the behavior and the view, I can also put a new file. And um, I can say ampersand it for the entire component. I can say, um, inside this, if I have any holder of likes, I can make its background to be purple. I can call it styles.css. Go back here. Oh, I messed something up. Why did I mess something up? Yes, I messed something up because. There's one more step I have missed. I think I'm supposed to go and import pod styles into my main import pod style is missing. Yes. I have to import this. So I think there's a small step in CSS file. I have to go here and in the top say import pod styles. So that whatever the pod gave out is also rendered by the page here. It still doesn't work. Holder mm -hmm. of likes. What am I missing? Move this, remove this. This ground. Okay, something has gotten messed up. Always good when it gets messed up in a demo. It shows nobody knows anything. Dot holder of likes, background color, styles.css, import pod. From here. Okay, I am. I don't know what I'm getting wrong here. Okay, something's not working. I'll figure out what went wrong and let you guys know. But basically, what this allows you to do is it now allows you to put the styles file with your template and your component and this entire folder. So if I want. I can I'll show you what it looks like in the finder. So I have I'm going to so I have my app. Inside my app, I have my pods. So inside pods components. So I can now, once I'm ready with this component, let's say I am working on this independently from other teams. You know, imagine you're a big company and you have multiple components you're working on. 
I can move this entire folder and give it to somebody, and because it's it has its own context, it has its own behavior, own template, own styling, it doesn't get affected by other people's code. So it becomes its own own bulletproof component. You pass data down, it's going to throw back actions. So I'm going to quickly show you how we can also like make the like button do certain things. So holder of like, let's say has a button. Let's call it like, and. Um, Oops. What this is going to do is it's going to action, same thing, uh, action button clicked. Okay. And um, this has component.js. Instead of click, I'm going to uh, let this, yeah, I'm going to change this. I'm going to put it in the actions hash. Button click. I'm going to say um, actions, which is the hash. All actions will exist in this. So, okay. So I have actions, actions button was clicked, alert, I was clicked. Right? Let's see if this works. So if I click the like button, the like button is too small. Why is the like button too small? Anyway, now sometimes what needs to happen is the component needs to handle things differently. Show error message. Alert, I am the controller meetup error. So I've made this new action, which is called show error message inside of um, our meetup controller. So this has to be passed into the like item. So the way to do that is we name, let's say, um, error message equals action show error message. So show error message belongs to this controller. So what's going to happen is it's going to get passed into the like item with, as an error message action. If these things don't make sense to you now, don't worry about it. Once you start, as I said, Ember, you need to know how things work a certain way. Um, once you know why this happens, or once you know how this happens, you won't have to worry about this in future. So anyway, what basically I'm doing is I'm passing controller's function to the component. The component doesn't know how to handle this because it, it doesn't know the full context. So what the controller is going to say, hey, you know when you show that error message, yeah, I want you to do this when that happens. So you're able to call a, call a parent function, which is called actions up. A parent function is called from inside of a child. So I'll show you what that looks like. So when this happens, instead of saying a template, the button is clicked. When the button is clicked, I, instead of saying alert, I was clicked, it says this dot get. So remember, when we pass it inside the component, we call it error message. So it's a hey, when you, so this dot get error message, we get that entire function which the controller has. And because to call a controller, you use parentheses. So you want to call, call that function. See what happens when I click this now. So I'm going to move this. When I click the like button, it says this dot get is not a function of. There is an error. OK, the reason why this is an error is this is the meetup page. If you go to the index page, we haven't passed an error message here. And since we haven't passed an error message here, when we click it, it tries to get something it doesn't have. If I go to slash meetup, the same button there and I click like, calls a function in the controller. So if you notice, this is a message we wrote inside the controller. The controller passed data down. And because the actions were linked, when an action was triggered inside of the component, it came up all the back up. It's called action bubbling. It came all the back up to the controller. So multiple people can now, now the people who are handling the controller know the logic they want to implement. The people handling the logic of component will work on that. And they can then connect it using actions and data. And the things will just flawlessly work. So that's basically a small walkthrough of how different components and So you can see how we have like segregated our code in nice little fashion. So like item, you know, something which is very specific handles its own code itself without worrying about how it, it should bubble up. And uh, people who manage the page are able to manage the page and style it the way they want. So Ember has now helped you break your work into multiple things and focus on what you need to get done there, which is very important for productivity because it helps you in keeping your code sync. And by the way, if you notice to get so much done with so many bindings and so many clicks and stuff, I wrote very little code. 
this is two lines of code. This is four lines of code here. This is some data here. Okay, you know, ten, then twenty-six lines of code. So not not a whole lot. These are like small snippets of templates which I wanted to use. I didn't have to write head, body, HTML, header, and nothing. I just started immediately focusing on. Okay, my component is this section. It should have a div and a button, and I put it in. I didn't have to worry about constraints. I didn't have to worry about where it gets rendered. I just had to make it. So, any questions? Just feel free to um, ask them here. Otherwise, you can proceed. Let me know what you want to do. I have like a tons of things I can show you in in demo, but for that, we need a bigger session, and that's what we're going to do in the workshop on Saturday. If you're interested in like learning more and actually doing it yourself, then please come up on Saturday. Oh, I was wondering what that noise was. Hey, folks. Uh, thanks for joining. What I'll do is I'll just take five minutes to brief about, uh, you know, the meetup group and also give some details in terms of, you know, contribute and share knowledge. Let me share my screen. OK, I uh, hope uh, all of you are able to see my screen. Angush, are you able to see the screen? Huh? OK. Yeah, uh, JavaScript meetup, I just wanted to give a brief. Uh, we have, uh, this meetup is full of volunteers. It is run 100% free where uh, it's a not-for-profit group. Uh, our main aim is to share knowledge, uh, bring techies together, and then uh, build a community where we have the, you know, uh, you know, we want the uh, knowledge sharing to happen and also probably build code that makes a difference in day-to-day -day life. We have a bunch of volunteers, as you see here in alphabetical order, I have listed all the volunteers uh, who make a difference. They do contributions in terms of uh, being a moderator, suggesting new things, and also building this whole community. Uh, they do that. And we also have repeat speakers uh, who have been uh, talking on various topics, Naveen and Andrew Singha Patro. They have given several sessions in our meetups. And we also have special participants who attend almost all the meetups that we conducted till date. And they also give constant feedback to us. We have supporters. While we are 100% free, we also need space. Uh, we need, uh, you know, the meetup.com fees to be paid on a monthly basis or quarterly basis. So we have the founding team, who is a code ops. Uh, they are uh, services as well as the training and also organized conferences. We have skewcode.com. Skewcode.com are located out of uh, BTM layout. Uh, they give us space whenever we conduct webinars. And Mithun is a very active member uh, who supports this community. And he had done uh, last time a session on uh, Slack overview and you know how to how to join and how to contribute using the Slack tool because we are moving away from uh, uh, WhatsApp. Yeah. The third one this is a recent entry in Tide Space. Uh, they are located out of JP Nagar. They have been willing to give the space and also arrange for the venue and also the facility in terms of snacks and other things going forward for conducting our meetups. That helps us, you know, going out of just the outer ring road where we conduct a lot of meetups in person to JP Nagar, which is the other side. Next, as I mentioned, this is a platform, a platform for web enthusiasts, not just JavaScript, but we also cover various areas. We are expanding beyond the JavaScript and JavaScript frameworks, share knowledge and contribute towards code that makes a difference. So if you feel that you have code which, is, which can be reused by others, please share it. We have um, modes in which you can share things with other members here. Uh, our solar system, though it is centered towards JavaScript, but we are open to JavaScript frameworks. And as I mentioned, uh, we are going beyond uh, where uh, we start doing topics, which are uh, web apps as well as app development going forward. Uh, where can you find us? I think we are a large group. We are around 3,400 plus members. Uh, most of our uh, registrations are the entry into this meetup happens through meetup.com group. You can go to this URL. Uh, slowly, we are coming out of the Bangalore as a keyword because we feel we are expanding beyond the boundaries of Bangalore. We want to be more a virtual community. So we renamed ourselves uh, last month JavaScript Meetup. 
uh, you can join slack slack is a very active group we are right now around uh, 450 members and uh, we are growing day in day out and we also see a lot of quality contributions people posting in terms of whether it is jobs whether it is queries on a day to day uh, work related there's a good active community. There are a good bunch of volunteers who help us out uh, for any kind of issues that we face. Uh, easiest way to join the group is, you know, tinyurl.com slash JSMeetup Slack. Uh, you can go there and then you can join the group. We have the uh, YouTube channel. Uh, you're probably seeing this from the YouTube channel. Subscribe to that. And if you are more keen, you are away from Bangalore and you more like to attend webinars from the conveners of your home or uh, mobile, you can always join the group and get notifications of upcoming webinars. As I mentioned, we want to be a community who is uh, a bunch of coders interested. If you have a code that can be reused by others, you want something to be tried and tested by others, please post it to GitHub. We have a JS Meetup BLR uh, as an account, and we will certainly invite others to uh, code review it and also use the code what you're bringing. Upcoming uh, next topic is uh, we have uh, people interested in terms of Chrome extensions. Uh, we have a speaker. Debashish will be doing the session and we also are expecting um, probably the next meetup sometime in December uh, to be on Chrome extensions. But uh, as and when we decide and share, I will send across to everyone else. Uh, that's it for now. If you have something else, uh, please let me know. Help out. Cool. So maybe I'll, I'll resume what was left of my presentation then. Oh, sure. Oh, sorry. I think uh, I thought I was just, uh, it was done. Sorry for that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. Go ahead. All right. Can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, cool. So um, that was a quick demo of what and how Ember is structured. And we'll do more when we meet up at the meetup. Um, now let's talk about something back to the boring theory stuff. So something about Ember is it likes to stay modern. And that's one of the things I touched on when I said, hey, I chose my uh, framework for my startup when I saw this feature. So this was in uh, when React had uh, claimed in its conference that it had been Ember in terms of speed. And it, it like had these convoluted use cases where it showed that Ember performance was uh, messing up. And it was like, look at us, we are so fast. First of all, it wasn't a complete out of the box solution, then you have to still pick and choose so many things you wanted to work. And even now, it's not a complete solution. Sure, there is Webpack, sure, there is Redux router, sure, sure there is other stuff. But at the end, you have to like kind of piece them together, and it's, it's, it's a pain. Um, Ember created their own templating engine, Glimmer. If, if not faster than React, it's equal to React with a bunch of things it does under the hood. And in order to use this new template, you had to make no line, no change in lines of code you had. So that was very good. All you had to do is go to your node package file, change it from 1.12 to 1.13, and you used a templating engine which was like faster than or equal to React. I mean, they don't like make the explicit claim it's faster, but it is equal to React. And um, yeah, it, it, it's very nice to get these new features without having to do anything. It's really good. So the question is, why is it so important to worry about new features coming out? So when I, I don't know how many uh, people were there on Angular one, and then moved to two, and then three, and then to four. Uh, but every time a new version of Angular comes out, you have to make a lot of changes. One to two was painful. And that is not something you want to do as a developer. When you're a developer, when you, the new versions come out, there, has, there becomes a choice. Code base, so I can use these new features. Or do I stay stuck to this old version of code? And if I'm on Ember 1.13, do I stay on 1.13, not use the features of two? because I can't upgrade, that's not good. That's a bad choice to make. Because as a developer, you should have the flexibility of moving to the new framework without having to do a lot of dead work. You shouldn't like be just wasting time in migrating. I mean, for some people, it's fun. But it's ultimately a waste of time. It's a waste of time for you, to the company, and you can solve a lot more problems if you didn't have to worry about this. The security and features is something you need, and you don't want to rewrite your code base. Ember just excels at this. The people who write Ember. Uh, who wrote Ember are very particular that the maintainability has to be super good. Um, they, you know, they scratch their own itch, has to say. So they come out with the best practices to migrate. 
So things which are going to go out of style for reasons, they explain why, be it performance, be it legacy, be it because new features are out in the browser or some features in the browser have been deprecated, which by the way, some people also provide you polyfills for. So if there's a feature which you really use, which shouldn't be used because they have their reasons and you want to use them, there are ways of doing it. But they, they make it difficult for you to do. They make it difficult for you to adopt old stuff. Um, Things which are going to get deprecated in future are given like warnings way in advance. So it's not like, hey, look at me, I'm Angular 4. There's so many new things I have. Oh, you have to read your code base. No, nothing is a surprise. It's, it's all known. You have all the time in the world to change it. And uh, because Ember is so good in managing its uh, supportability, there are also LTS versions, long-term support versions of the Ember. So for companies, they can stick to a particular version and know that for the next two years, it's going to be continually supported. So that kind of assurance in building your app or product out it is very nice, having the LTS support out with you. And when a new version comes out, which requires some changes, migration instructions are very straightforward, up and front. They tell you why, how, and what of things. And they try to automate it for you. So as I said, you know, when they wanted to use the new JavaScript API modules in 2.16 instead of 2.15, 2.15, and 2.16, uh, they give you a code mod. So you install the code mod, you run it on your code, and boom, it just changes everything for you. All this uh, in the app, if you've noticed these neat little things, um, you know, import controller from Ember controller, and uh, I'm not using more of them, but they happen automatically now. Before this wasn't the case, before it would by default import everything. They automatically now break it for you, and they retroactively apply it to your older code base. That's very nice. And uh, you know, Ember constantly borrows from other frameworks. As I said, when React came out and the way React was doing things, Ember did take it as an integration and uh, implement that in its own templating engine to make it faster. And this was in 2015. Since then, they have like really made the framework a lot better than before. So now comes the part where, where Ember is heading. So as I spoke to you before, Ember as a framework, if you wanted to run, it came as a bundled package. If you were just using the templates of Ember, you're not using controllers, services, any of the other stuff, that code was still there because Ember was built that way. But that's no longer the case. They are breaking their code into different modules. They're doing tree shaking. So they'll only ship the part of uh, Ember framework which you are using, not the entire um, ecosystem. There's something called Ember Engines. So Ember Engines is basically running an app with another app. So let's say we are making this meetup page, which is an app of its own. And now we need a support chat bubble like Intercom. So that is its own Ember app. And because it's not important to run that app immediately. You run the meetup page when everything in the meetup page loads. You can now lazy load the other Ember app, the Intercom bubble, and uh, you can then connect the two apps. So Intercom bubble has its own context, stays separate, loads separately, is managed separately, but it still has a way of interacting with another app. It's, I won't call it a parent and a child app. I would call it more like sibling apps. Um, there is something called fast boot. Now, um, if you notice, every time you open up Slack, Right? Uh, I don't know how many teams you have, but let's say you're going to the Bangalore Slack. Somebody send you a notification, you click it. So by default, the container of the Slack first loads. If there's a long loading time, then it loads the channels. Then the channel or, or the person gets loaded, then the old messages are loaded with the new message, and then you navigate to the new message. So you waste a whole lot of time in order to reach that notification which you just got. And that slows things, that, that breaks the experience. The same thing happens on Facebook. If you notice Facebook, when it loads, the background gets loaded. Inside that, the video then pops up. You're first taken to Facebook, and then and the video pops up, and then the comments load, and then the video plays. So that wasn't what you wanted to watch. You directly wanted to just, you got a link from your friend, you just want to dive right into the video. So that is basically, it's following the route, right? It's following slash, uh, sorry, facebook.com slash, um, whatever is the home of the Facebook app, then slash, um, um, post slash video slash video number slash comment slash comment number. So it's going, it's doing everything step by step. Until the previous step is not loaded, it can't go to the next one. But fast food is a technology wherein you render your app on the server side. So people who have not so powerful devices, they are on mobile. You load the entire state of the app with the entire route and the entire video or whatever you're watching. You load it as HTML, send it to the client, and then the rest of the app loads. So when you click that link, there is no loading spinner, which you see the app just loads for you instantly into the video you watched, and instantly into the chat message you wanted to read, instantly in the comment you wanted to see posted. So this uh, recently got 1.0. It's becoming very good. Um, it's, just, it's called server-side rendering, very helpful, very useful. You'll see it. Incremental hydration is a similar concept. 
where for mobile, it makes sure that things are loaded in a way. So when you scroll, there are no jitters, everything at a 60 FPS performance. The phone app is just smooth and, and slick to use. So Ember has focused on all these new things which are coming up. Passport, you know, can give it a try. I mean, not important now. Ember engines, again, the same thing. That's basically uh, what the future of Ember looks like. You know, uh, they also have more technologies like service workers. They have their own data persistence layer called Ember Data. So when you are in, in in countries where the internet is not so good, they have their own cache. They have uh, their ways to make the experience not seem broken for the user. Like there are so many hospitals in Africa which use Ember-based apps uh, where the data is stored locally. And then when you connect to internet, it's then synced using Pouch and CouchDB. It's, it's just very cool. It's called Hospital Run. There are, there are like a bunch of things which the framework can do for you or help you do. So um, that's basically what I have. And um, you know, any questions you have and any um, discussions you want to do, let's do it. And thank you. Maybe we should have like a hangout session now so the people who are interested can talk. There are only 10 people there, right? Right, I think uh, going forward, you know, I think we can switch to complete that one. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if uh, anybody's interested in doing the hangouts now, if you have any questions or talk further, you know, we can do it or we can just send this meter. So let me know what you guys want. Any comments in the window? I'm just checking. Yeah, I know I'm replying to them. The video is like way behind. It's still. Okay. okay, I think I'm going to close this. Stop screen sharing now. And I'm now on camera. Cool. Okay. I think if somebody has further questions, uh, you can continue on Slack. Okay. Uh, joining Slack is easy. Uh, you can just uh, probably I'll just give the URL. It's uh, tinyurl.com slash JS Meetup Slack. And we can continue the question and answers offline. And Ankush, whenever you want to uh, finish the Q&A, uh, let me know. And then we'll wind up. Sure. Uh, we can stop this live stream. And we can just do the chat and go back on Slack. OK, OK. Thanks. Thanks, everybody, for joining uh, late evening on uh, today. Thank you very much. Bye. Thanks, everybody. Bye. See you soon. Bye. Bye.